Familiar things can be very strange. There's probably nothing more familiar to you than your mind. Most of us have one, most of the time. It's a thing we own and a thing we are. And yet, like a lens through which the world can be seen, but which is itself invisible, the mind can be a difficult subject for its own scrutiny. Thinkers who have set out to chart this most familiar of territories have found themselves in a bizarre and alien landscape. The strange story of minds is one which matters. An understanding of minds informs the way we act in the world, towards others and ourselves, and helps us know right from wrong. But the need to get a real grip on the mind, how it works, what it's made of, has never been more pressing. And that's all thanks to artificial intelligence. AI raises the prospect that, for the first time outside the confines of biological reproduction, we might be able to build new minds. Answering the question of how they can come to exist then takes on a new importance, so that we can one day create them if we want to, and avoid doing so if not. And so we assign moral value only to creatures which deserve it while not seeing life in the sparking of dead algorithms. So this is really a story about a question, one to which we don't yet have an answer. And that's the best part. It's unfinished, and nobody knows how it will end. But we know how it begins. On the coast of Sicily, more than two millennia ago, with a theft and a murder. You have to do quite a bit to be remembered thousands of years after your death. But then, Archimedes did more than most. The Greek from ancient Syracuse was first and foremost one of the most accomplished mathematicians of his day. But theory was not his only game. He lived in an era where philosophers stood shoulder to shoulder with soldiers and sailors, as was the case in Syracuse when, in 213 BC, the Romans arrived. When the Roman Republic eventually captured the city after a long siege, the attacking soldiers were under strict instructions to seize Archimedes unharmed. He had spent the war building deadly machines which had cost many of the invaders' lives. But you don't become as successful as Rome without a pragmatic attitude, and this maverick old Greek was an asset. Unfortunately, at least one soldier didn't get this memo, Though Archimedes died that day, his most remarkable invention survived. The victorious Romans seized a set of two planetariums, whose mechanisms charted the movements of the moon, sun, and planets circling the Earth, as they were believed to in the days before Copernicus. These were scientific marvels, making use of sophisticated clockwork technology, which wouldn't become known to modern science for another 2,000 years. The planetariums survive only in the recollections of a handful of near contemporaries, such as Cicero, so we don't really have much idea how they work. The one I'm depicting is supposed to be pretty, rather than reproduce them faithfully. They may have represented the sun, moon and planets as a system of wooden or stone balls rotating inside a glass sphere. Or, they may have symbolized them as hands on a celestial clock face, each moving at varying rates, similar to the Antikythera mechanism from around the same period. But we do know that the devices must have been very advanced to accurately model the phases of the moon, the relative motions of the planets, and the timings of solar eclipses. The importance of these early clockwork machines to artificial intelligence perhaps isn't obvious, but I'd argue they represent the earliest rumblings of what was to come a quiet cognitive revolution whose effects wouldn't be properly felt for thousands of years. If you were to study the planetarium's predictions for the coming astronomical year, you might conceivably speak of the machine's belief 
that a solar eclipse will occur at a certain time, or its knowledge of the moon's current phase. These kinds of terms wouldn't make any sense at all in referring to other machines of the era, such as levers or catapults. Before the planetarium's machines did things, but they couldn't be said to know or believe them. These words are an allusion to mental life. Of course, we humans are lazy in our use of language and prone to metaphor, so the ascription of mental properties like knowledge and belief isn't necessarily a serious one. But let's ask the question more seriously. Let's ask of the planetarium as it quietly revolves. What is it thinking about? These machines are simple, at least by modern standards. So simple, perhaps, that it seems ridiculous to wonder whether they could be thinking anything, or have feelings, or emotions, or any kind of inner life at all. But if that is your instant reaction, take a moment to try to justify it to yourself. Can you say why? Or what the question even means? The border between intuition and reason can prove a difficult one to cross. Archimedes believed that the right machine could move the world. Fast forward through the ages, and history has largely proved him right. We have machines for communicating over vast distances, machines for telling us where to go, and machines for getting us there in moments. Machines which create miniature stars and pass the energy to other machines which heat our homes and banish the night. Unless you're spying on me recording this, you're probably listening to my voice coming from a machine right now. But though 2000 years has widened the scope of their behavior and enhanced the complexity of their mechanisms, the question of whether they are doomed to remain mere machines, or could maybe be something more, isn't much clearer or more settled. Clockwork was replaced by vacuum tubes, and then by transistors, but philosophers have found mines no easier to locate in silicon than in brass and wood. And yet, we have no trouble believing that some arrangements of matter, such as the lump of electric jelly sitting between your ears, can give rise to minds. So the natural question occurs. Given the attendant mess and indignity of biological procreation, might there be other, more sanitary ways to structure matter so as to create minds? This question is really the foundation of artificial intelligence, which is built on the premise that the answer is at least, maybe. Many AI practitioners wouldn't recognize this idea, attend one of their conferences or read one of their papers, and it's very unlikely you'll meet a serious discussion of minds. That's partly because the AIs we can currently build are too simple and restricted to prompt much speculation as to their inner mental lives. But it's also because, for many researchers, AI isn't about building minds. It's about optimizing statistical algorithms to understand data and solve problems. This is a powerful idea which, for better or worse, has grown to dominate the field. The history of AI started with myth and religion, then came the philosophers and computer scientists. Now though, it's largely a statistician's game. I would never claim that these statistical approaches are useless. Far from it. From diagnosing cancer to cybersecurity, they certainly have more use today than the AI I'm going to talk about. There's a reason the field's resources are overwhelmingly funneled towards these approaches. They generate practical results. But practical results do not necessarily make for artificial intelligence. My contention is that what's going on in the field at present, valuable though it is, represents a narrow conception of what AI is and could be, a misappropriation rather than a realization of the original concept, and that outside of highly restricted situations, it's a flawed approach which aims to tackle only one side of a two-part problem. Because building AI is fundamentally about solving two challenges. There's the engineering problem. How do we arrange matter so as to produce intelligence? But in order to complete this task, we must first solve a philosophical problem. Just what is intelligence? What is the goal we're building towards? 
like drunks searching under the light for keys which could be anywhere. Researchers tend to steer clear of this philosophical quagmire, instead preferring simple problems with well-defined success criteria, like spotting a tumour on a PET scan, or winning a game of chess. But there are many things we might want an AI to do, many ways we might want it to be, where success is unavoidably defined in mental terminology. We want to make AIs which behave creatively, for example, or reason, or exhibit empathy. The distinction between AIs which are intelligent minds and those which are merely intelligent, in the sense of performing tasks well, is therefore a false one. And to attempt to build mental capacities without an understanding of what they are, would be like painting a still life in the dark. You might get it right, but it's unlikely, and you'd never be sure. I call this problem the problem of building a machine with a mind, the problem of true AI. It's distinct from artificial general intelligence, or AGI, which is about making machines that can do multiple kinds of things. It's also not the same thing as superintelligent AI. Minds need not be superintelligent to be minds, and indeed no biological minds fit this description. It's also distinct from strong AI, which is a term I prefer to avoid because nobody can seem to agree on what it means. True AI also has the benefit of a provocation. Without a discussion of minds, AI researchers aren't really doing AI at all. But what of that discussion? I've been carelessly throwing around terms like mind, thought, and feeling, without offering an account of what they mean. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but, as I've been trying to argue, I don't think there's a good way around asking the question. We can either try to understand minds and their relationship to the world, or go on painting in the dark. There's hope. Smart people have been thinking about this for a long time, and I'd like to share some of their ideas with you in the coming videos. My aim is to present topics that can often be quite tough and dry, in a way which is comparatively soft and moist. To that end, I'm working, amongst other things, on a story about a robot and an oracle, the tale of an alien abduction, and a discussion of current AI technology as a dialogue between nursery rhyme characters. You may think it all nonsense, but I hope you'll find it interesting.